the wind of uh, political correctness and cultural relevance has swept away like a powerful hurricane all desire to speak as the oracles of God, verse Peter 4, 11. To simply preach the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, Luke 8, 11. And you can say that this lesson is somewhat of continuation of this morning, although a little different, but not much. And contending earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints is just unheard of. But that's been that way for a long, long time. More than a lot of people realize. Jude 3. First of all, when you read the first inspired words, remember that was a letter in which Jude was saying, now I was going to write about the salvation that's common to all of us. But then, what does he say? He felt the need to remind them of their duty to contend for the faith. Why would he have to remind them of that? Because everybody in the church, according to their several ability and opportunity, has an obligation to defend the very faith that saves our souls from hell. That's why. Now, everybody can't be, and all the time it's not called for, a public debater. But it bothers me to some extent to, in fact, to a great extent, it used to bother me more than it does now because I've gotten used to it. How many young people, and especially young preachers, have never even attended an oral debate? In fact, what they've heard more than anything else is you shouldn't do that, it's not good. Debating just doesn't work at all. And some people have said, well, you know, look how, look how they do in a debate. But I can make the same arguments toward people preaching. If people are going to abuse preaching and do it contrary to the teaching of the New Testament, I just do not hear them preach. And I think there's a lot of that done. What passes for gospel preaching today wouldn't have many years ago. The Lord's church is ceasing to be evangelistic. They're happy with outside and their political correctness and they're leaving the fundamentals of truth and no respect for authority and such things. And we don't want to get too disturbed about it. We happen to live in a time when people aren't anxious to come out and hear Religious things discussed. Well, when I think about it, and I see what's on television and what's been going on. I don't know why I'd want to go out and hear some of that stuff anyway. It's boring. Nothing to it. It's a bunch of fluff and cotton candy. There's not much there. It doesn't challenge anything. If it does anything, it makes a person say, well, I feel real good. I may have been fornicating last night and drunk the night before that and plan on going out tonight. But after all, God's got a grace, and don't judge me. God loves me, and so I'm, I'm okay. And you've heard the idea of I'm okay, you're okay. So that's been around for a number of years now. What we're seeing in our society and this woke culture and so forth, it's just this thing coming further and further to a head. But I tell you, believe me or not, and I'm no prophet nor son of a prophet, we haven't seen the end of it yet, nor how far it's going to go. I'd love to be able to live long enough to see it turn around. And I mean a genuine turn around and head the other direction. But I don't know that I will. But there's some of you, if time continues, you're going to be here. And you know God's expecting you to serve him and maybe the part of turning the thing around. In 1815, John Adams, one of the founding fathers and president, and this is, we hear this quoted mostly from this letter that he wrote, 
that at the time of the revolution, as it was about to start in the 13 colonies, that about a third were for the revolution, and a third didn't care one way or the other, they ambivalent toward it, and a third was still to support of, in support of England, wanting to remain a subject of the British Empire. I think later study <clears throat> of that letter has um, shown us a little more by throwing a little more light on the context of it that he was actually saying that the people in America had that attitude toward the French and their support of the revolution. But the point I really want to make is what is absolutely true, whether it would be a third were for it and a third were ambivalent and a third were for the, Brit the, the British it was still a very small percentage, much less than half of the population of 13 colonies that were really for at the beginning, I mark that, at the beginning of the revolution. And then it gained ground. And it gained ground because of much of the conduct of those colonists who sought the revolution, who wanted it, who wanted to be independent. And they started making more converts among those who were either ambivalent or else they were still in support of Mother England. Of course, once the thing was uh, ended, then a whole host of what they call Tories, or the loyalists, all left America for Canada or back to England. So that left even a higher percentage of the people in America who were for independence. What's my point in all of that? My point is simply this. It was through, in fact, what was said in one history book I read, and Steve, you'll appreciate this. It says it was through the propaganda of the colonists who wanted independence that they were better at it than were the Tories and others by showing why we should want to be independent. Point is, it was a minority. Maybe not such a small minority, but it was a minority and they converted more people to their side through their teaching. Is that strange? Look at the beginning of the church. How many people in comparison or in contrast to all of Israel were really embracing Christ. Even though you have 3,000 added to the church the day it started in Jerusalem, that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, that's still just 3,000. And if you look at how many Jews attended those feast days, there were many, many thousands of them. But what did the Lord teach when he taught about the spreading of the kingdom? Well, it's like a mustard seed that's so small very very small and yet it grows into a bush that birds nest in what's that saying it starts real little and it grows well the lord's church grows because the members are propagating the truth at every opportunity you know what that means you don't let people alone but we're in an age that says, let people alone. Now, are they consistent with this? No. They mainly mean, let me alone to teach whatever I want to teach, no matter how far away from the truth of God it is. And you just shut up. And the woke philosophy simply says, those who believe it have a right to speak and be heard. Those who don't must be silenced. And of course, if you see the rise of the Nazis in Germany, that's exactly what they did. And if you go listen to Hermann Goering's testimony at the uh, Nuremberg trials after the war, he doesn't uh, pull any punches about saying when we came to power, we shut down every way of opposition to us. And that's exactly how Satan's 
henchmen work. They do not want to be on the polemic platform where they have to defend what they teach and have it weighed in the balances by someone who knows how to do that. But the thing I'm speaking about right now is where is the spark within us that we read of in the Bible through countless records of faithful men who suffered for the cause of Christ and would not give up the message and they had a burning in their bones to use an Old Testament statement to spread the truth and defend it. They couldn't be quiet. Where is that? People have become infatuated with worldly sophistication and subjective concepts which means it means whatever you want it to mean and it changes from person to person in time to time, situation to situation. So many people have simply grown weary of objective truths. That is a thing is just what it is. It corresponds with reality. This person who set himself on fire just recently well, I don't know what all was wrong with him, but I guarantee you he had something wrong in his mind. I remember back in the Vietnam War when you'd see Buddhist monks over in Saigon setting themselves on fire. They may not be called <coughs> mentally off by psychologists or psychiatrists, but they are. They are. When Judas went out and hanged himself, his mind wasn't working right. Now, he was the fault of it, responsible for it. And by the way, a lot of folks may be loony, if you want to call it that. But they're responsible for doing the things and not doing other things that put them there. Other people may not help it, but that's another story. We're talking about what you can help. You know, God is not going to hold us accountable for things we absolutely could not do and we're not responsible for. He won't do it. Well, we have, as there was during the Revolutionary War and always in every war, there's been turncoats and traitors to the cause, whatever cause it might be. In this case, the cause of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Lord's church has been ridiculed and mocked by all kinds of false religions and false philosophies. And the denomination used to have a heyday in mocking the church. They'd tell something like, well, the earth is over and done with. Judgment's taking place. We're all in heaven now. The Baptists are visiting with the Methodists, the Methodists with the Presbyterians, and so on. And one group says to the other group, now be real quiet. That little group off there in the corner is the Church of Christ. They think they're the only ones here. That kind of stuff was told. The problem is our own brethren came to believe that kind of stuff regardless of what the Bible says. But the Bible's full of material that says, out of all that's ever lived, only a few get there. I don't know why we can't understand that. The Lord said, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Now, you know, that was, that was written 2,000 years ago, but just is up to date and fresh as the morning knew and true. But then it says, the son of man also shall be ashamed of him. When he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels, Mark 8, 38. Brethren, I do not, I do not want my Savior to be ashamed of me when he comes back. Don't want him to. That sort of lets you understand why Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation. I do not want to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's God's power to save us from sin. But when I'm not content with the way things are taught in the New Testament, and I don't even know how to write and divide the word of truth, and I must, as I study it, 2 Timothy 2.15, and it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Right in dividing the word of truth. 
Well, I know one time I'll be ashamed, and that is if I don't write and divide the word of truth, if I don't put into practice the truth of God, which involves standing up for what's right and exposing what's wrong, I'll be ashamed to stand before the Lord, and he'll be ashamed of me. Now, those who profess to be members of the church of Christ, but who on they, I guess you'd say unwaveringly, steadfastly with regularity support all kinds of apostates and this this dates here uh, you don't hear as much about them quite as much as you ought to people like Rubel Shelley and Max Licato Joe Beam Jeff Walling Rich Axley and Lynn Anderson and that just names a very few not a, the, these were around 20 25 30 years ago uh, they were a little more close to really the early advocates but I can go back to the early 70s and 60s and name some that I doubt anybody would, would recognize that were in the forefront of a lot of this. I remember, he's been dead for a number of years, a fellow by the name of Roy Osborne. He was a rank false teacher. Brought him in to preach the college church in a gospel meeting so-called at Searcy, when I was in Harding, all during the day, during the week, he met with different devotionals in all the men's dorms, and he sowed his seed. And I was in Austin when he died. And uh, the preacher there at that time at the college church, now we're talking about the 60s folks, Ray Chester. He was in Austin when I was there preaching for the Christian church. When he died, the disciples of Christ, one preacher preached his funeral. And still people would say, is there really anything wrong? Don't be so judgmental. Well, nowadays, I don't know where to begin in labeling a whole host of folks that are right now holding the same views these folks did, only now they're in comfortable territory. They can do these things, get by with them, nobody's going to say anything. At least back in those days, there were people trying to say something. More people then, maybe, than now, and there wasn't nearly enough then. Many brethren are enamored with so-called Christian universities, such as Lipscomb and Abilene, and on you can go. But then they don't have much use for congregations of God's people that demand a thus saith the Lord for everything they believe in practice. And by that I mean Bible authority for what they believe in practice. You know, none of the universities today, if you go back and study the history of them, and I'm talking about those higher education institutions that were started by our brethren. None of them start, were started by people and early on supported by them that would uphold much of anything that's being taught, at least in their religion or Bible or whatever they call their departments nowadays. They wouldn't support them. They wouldn't be even welcome on the campus. The sad part about it is we here in spring or in other places in the United States or the world, we get busy about making a living and we get on to Bible class on Wednesday night and worship on Sunday and we go back and forth. Unless we have some connection in family or friends or some way keeping up with stuff, we don't know what's going on. But we have an obligation to do that. And what happens is an institution that was set up to aid the home in doing good things gets corrupted and the people don't notice it. And then it gets to be so important to them, they're more loyal to it than the Lord's church itself. And thus the tail begins to wag the dog. And I tell you right now, that tail is wagging the dog nowadays to where the dog's a blur. You can't even see it. It's obvious just how far our brethren have drifted when these institutions, like I'm talking about, and by the way, they're man-made. They're made as an expedient and an advantage to help. 
But when they start upholding false doctrine, that truth is not absolute and objective, or that you can be immodest when it comes to teaching an art class, and on and on, there's no end to it. You just have to know enough to ask and to go along. Now you can oppose those things. They're not going to quit because there's too many people behind them that don't care and they can go right on. So they have more loyalty by their supporters in, in upholding them in what they do than those same supporters have toward the Lord's church. I think we live in an age that's gone so long to where people in the church who've been for several generations connected through families and so on have reached a, a point where they cannot envision in their mind the Lord's church existing without higher ed education. I think if you say, all right, now envisage in your mind the Lord's church existing and none of these university and colleges are around, I don't think they can do it. I think they think those have to be there for us to be the church the Lord wants us to be. Where do we learn such a thing? I certainly don't read of the New Testament. I haven't seen the Jerusalem Christian University in the well, does that mean you're opposed to them like the anti-college people were by saying it's unscriptural to have them? No. I think brethren can get together and they can do what they can as families and individuals to help their children grow and develop. But you can't get to the point to where you just allow that to stand and it can just go on doing as it pleases regardless of the teaching of the Bible. And nobody cares. Folks who will fight tooth and toenail for, we might call it the shrines of men, won't really support much of anything when it comes to the Lord's church, the kingdom of heaven. All I can say is there needs to be some serious repenting done. Because a thing was at one time a wholesome, good, scriptural thing, I guess I could just say they're scriptural and that would make it wholesome and good. Doesn't mean it just always stays that way. Any more than a person who obeyed the gospel 30 years ago simply because they did it and were honest then and they were Christians, that they still are. You know, that sure would, if that was the case, that would sure ruin 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that a latter time some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing dev, uh, demons and, uh, or doctrine of devils, seducing spirits and doctrine of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with hot iron. And then gives you some of the things they would teach. The point is this. These folks were genuine Christians. They obeyed the gospel from the heart, Romans 6, 17, and 18, and 3 and 4. They departed from the faith. The Holy Spirit says they departed from the faith. You cannot depart from something you were not a part of. Timothy is a preacher. Paul is a preacher and an apostle. The New Testament is being written, and this letter is there saying, just because they say they're this or that or the other, and maybe at one time they were, does not guarantee right now they are. Try the spirits to see whether they be of God. For many false prophets gone out in the world. Put them to the test. Yeah, but brother so-and-so has been used in all kinds of gospel meetings, writes all kinds of articles, written umpteen books, appears on this lectureship and that lectureship. He's been doing that for 20 years. And so we don't ever question him. I remember very well, and I had Brother Bales when I was in college. I, one reason I went to Harding when I did was to be able to sit in some of his classes. Frankly, some of the other stuff didn't appeal to me, but I won't sit in his classes because I knew how he was a contender for the faith in those days. And when I was considering his situation, I remembered then after I was long out of school when his doctrine came up. 
which says people outside the church are not amenable to the law of Christ. Therefore, you can marry and divorce and remarry all you want to outside of Christ. It doesn't make any difference who you're living with. At the point you obey the gospel, that's all right. That's one of the things he believed. And you know, that bothered me because I thought so much of him. I used to go to his office, and that was a, <laughs> that's a, if you missed going to Brother Bale's office, you missed a, a tour of a great museum that was in action just to see. He sat me down one day. He says, I want to show you how I write a book. And I saw how he did it, and he took the time to do it. If you ask him a question, and he had already answered it somewhere, which he could very well have done it, then he'd just reach up and get a paper with it in there and said, here's, here, read that. That's the answer to your question. But he would also take time to talk to you. And it was, kind of, it was pretty much of a blow to have somebody you'd look to like that and thought so much about it. And some of you will be aware of this. When I had the debate here in Houston sometime before I ever moved over here with Bob Ross, it was on the Holy Spirit. And I received a book that Brother Bales had written on the Holy Spirit. He sent it to me to help me, even though we were estranged from the standpoint of doctrine. Well, I never hated him. I still appreciate him. I'm sorry that so many people, after he went off on this crazy doctrine, crusaded for it. Well, I only know him for that. I have about every one of his books. They even have permission to use his material. I didn't give him any credit. <laughs> the point is, to have lived through all of that, benefited from it, know people personally, and then see them depart from the faith, that, that's not a pleasing thing to me. Not a pleasing thing at all. That doesn't mean I have the right to go against the truth simply because somebody of that stature had gone off, he, he needed to be tried. I remember when Brother Roy Lanier Sr., just before he died in about 1979, was brought to Muskogee, Oklahoma, preaching to another congregation where I didn't preach, but he was preaching on marriage, divorce, remarriage, and basically answering the Baal's doctrine because some in that church were embracing and trying to defend it on the basis of Brother Baal's arguments. And he said, you know, Brother Baal's wrote me and said, I won't believe that you won't fellowship me anymore unless I hear it from you directly. And he said, I wrote him back. He said, if it was just a matter of what's a good, better, best, or an expedient way of getting something done, and we disagreed on that, there'd be no problem. But said, you can't teach a doctrine that when people believe and obey it, they lose their souls over it and remain in fellowship with me, and I can't do the same thing with you if it's the other way around. See, that's the difference in an obligatory matter. Brother Bales was teaching people could live in a marriage union and everything's all right, though they didn't have authority from God to be married, Matthew 19, 6 and 9. So in those days, there were people who had known one another and for years had supported each other. But they had to go their different ways because of the conviction of the truth, because somebody left the truth. There's still this, among a whole lot of folks, a craving, I guess, is the way to describe it, to be like the denominations around us. Something says, I don't know what it is, it's, maybe it's a psychological thing, I want to be accepted by these other folks. Well, I guess maybe I'm a little bit different. I don't care whether you accept me or not when it comes to that kind of thing. If I'm accepted, let me be accepted because I love and obey the truth. Why else would a person want to be accepted? Young men and women who've received degrees from the universities like I'm talking about, but they remain ignorant of the authority of the Bible, are doing more, nothing more than fanning the flames. They fan those flames to the point where it's burning down the whole house. And you could go on and on and list various things that we don't have time to do today in this sermon. Ephesians 4 and verse 4, Paul said to the church in Ephesus, 
that there were those who were tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and the slight of men who in cunning craftiness deceive and take away people. Uh, focus on the slight of men. That's being slippery. Slipping around. They're not open and above board. They're not willing to publish what they say where everybody can see it and then be able to have it challenged. They're not going to do that. The desire of many brethren to be like the denominations is akin to those in Samuel's day who wanted to have a king because they wanted to be like everybody else, 1 Samuel 8, 6. And you'll remember that Samuel, faithful Samuel, carried the matter to God in prayer. And God answered say, in saying, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. And then he tells you why he's where he is at that time in taking this position with Israel. For they've not rejected thee, but they've rejected me, that I shall not be king over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, and that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now, therefore, hearken unto their voice. Howbeit thou shalt protest solemnly unto them, and shalt show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Samuel told all the words of Jehovah unto the people that ask of him a king. 1 Samuel 8, 7 and 10, American Standard, 1901. In other words, getting that king is not going to help matters any, like you think it is. If you'd follow what I told you to do, there would be no need for a king. But have you ever noticed what went before that? Samuel's sons weren't fit to take over. There was a whole host, you know, this is the days of the judges, a whole host of stuff going on among them. Israel. And what's happening to the people are saying, well, maybe if we had a king like everybody else, this wouldn't happen. Well, you've got one. He's called the great I am. Your problem is, think of the days of the judges. You won't stay true to him. Samuel, faithful to God, explained to the people that the selection of a king would really not be in their best spiritual interest. 1 Samuel 8, 19 through 20, but the people refused to hearken unto the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. I've often thought about that. Did anybody remember that? When Goliath is coming out and challenges them, and Saul and all of them are hiding behind the tent flaps, peeping out. They should have learned a lesson that day. That doesn't always work, does it? What works is a person, no matter how old or young, who's faithful to God. That's what works. Brethren, the desire to be like all the nations or to be like the denominations or be like any worldly anybody is really one and the same. It's the same defiant attitude revealed by the great prophet Jeremiah. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But notice the response. But they said, we will not walk therein. Jeremiah 6, 16. We have to, if we're to be faithful, to realize there's going to be a whole host of folks that say we're not going to do it. Do what? Do what the Bible said. But we still want to be thought of as God's people. Well, that's denominationalism. And that's where we're headed, and that's where many of us already are. And there are many who still assemble, and they may not come out and say anything, although many of them are emboldened and have for some time now doing it, but they still have those inner thoughts and feelings. Just don't trouble the waters. So let's continue to aver that people worship in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24, when, of course, they're not. 
Spirit's the right attitude we're directing our worship to God from the heart. In truth is as the truth tells us to. That's God's truth. And those who insist on being ashamed of God's way and embarrassed by the church, as we read about it on the pages of the New Testament, I know if they don't repent where it's going to wind up, I don't have to wonder about that. It's going to wind up in a devil's hell. If we would just realize that everybody in this room, everybody in spring, everybody in the whole state of Texas and the world who are accountable to God for their thinking and actions, are either children of God, acceptable to Him because of their faithful obedience to the truth and lifestyle, or they're children of the devil. That's it. We're in one of the two camps. And I know what's going to happen to those who are children of the devil. Depart from me, I never knew you, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I don't want to hear that. Does anybody here honestly want to hear that? And you know what's going to happen when that's said? They're going to march right off in the torment. After having bowed the knee and confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Because the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. You probably picture that in your mind. You see Stalin and Mussolini and you see... Hitler, and you see all of that crowd and people like them. You see Billy Graham. You see all those people. All the denominational people. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. You're saved to the point of belief without any other acts of obedience. They're going to find out that's not true. And it read that way in the Bible all along. You can use mechanic instrument music, or you can hum, or you can clap your hands, or you can do whatever, and that's all right, just so you're sincere. You can take the Lord's Supper on the Monday as well as the first day of the week. You can be covetous. And do whatever you want to with your money. You can't tell those people how you're going to do anything. You can do all of that. You've got all the freedom to do that right now. God says go ahead and do it. You're a free moral agent. You have the will to choose to do my will or to choose to do what you want. Now make the choice. But when you make that choice, not to submit to his will and to stay that way until you die, but I'm telling you right now, you're going to hear depart from me. And once you depart and you go in that eternal torment, there's no coming out. And I think it was Ken who said, you have to bear the unbearable. And I know the rich man, when he lifted up his eyes, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. And I know he said, send Lazarus over here at the tip of his finger, dipped in water and touched it to my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. I'll never stop. Except that's in the spirit world. He'll be raised into a body that is fitted for hell. And it'll be worse than ever then. I don't know how it's worse than ever, but it will be. Because he will receive exactly from a perfectly just God what he deserved. And it'll be that way forever and forever. And I don't know how many forevers you want to put on the end of it. But there's not enough. That's the reason we have to be careful. That's the reason we have to care what the church is. We have to care what each Christian is. We have to begin with ourselves and make sure we're believing and obeying the truth. Be concerned about our brethren in Christ. People are talking about fellowship. Why? Why can't fellowship and being concerned about one another as to where we're walking the straight and narrow way or not? Why isn't that talked about in fellowship? That's the greatest fellowship. You help me to go to heaven and me to help you go to heaven. Both of us knowing the only way to do that is to walk the straight and narrow way of divine truth that pertains to salvation and never depart from it. But we get busy with this old flesh and this world and the church sort of takes a second, third, fourth, fifth seat or place. I'd like to think that this congregation is one step up from a lot of congregations. But brethren, 
I don't know what goes on in your mind, and you don't know completely what goes on in my mind. Only God does and you do. So if I can say something, if I can remind people that the church exists in any generation simply because people love the truth more than life itself and they're willing to sacrifice to obey it, if I could just instill that in people about obeying the truth as it is in the Bible, I would have at least accomplished something. But it seems to be in every generation a great battle to get brethren to do that. And over the last 60, 50 years, it's been a losing battle in a lot of cases. And as more and more people who once grew up and lived their lives and grew old and died, who were well grounded in the faith, they're not around like they used to be. And some of us who were the young people at that time aren't young people anymore. <laughs> And we're always just one generation away from apostasy. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, begin the righteous race to heaven with the determination not to give it up. John's the youngest. He's the baby of the three elders. And he's no spring chicken. There's got to be a time coming when the three elders that presently are here are going to be in their graves unless the Lord comes back first. Our deacons are a little bit younger, whatever that means, J.D. We already have trouble getting Bible class teachers because you can't teach what you don't know and you've got to be dedicated to study and know and be grounded so you can teach at the various levels. How does all that take place? How do you become a good Bible teacher, Nancy? Sonia, Jody, how do you become that? Barbara, study on your part, teaching it. But I, I'm, I'm walking on real thin ice here. Some of these aren't spring chickens either. <laughs> so who's going to take their place? So you think about that for the good of this congregation, and I'll say it again. If there's still people meeting in this place as a religious assembly, they're still owned by a religious group 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, what will they believe and what will they practice? What will be going on? all depends upon us and it begins today either becoming a Christian or renewing your faith or being more determined about what you ought to be some of you need to obey the gospel right now I don't know why you're not doing it you're lost you're outside of Christ if you died right now on the way home you won't be with some of your kinfolk you love so much because they're going to be in heaven you're going to have to go somewhere else forever now they would obey the gospel for you if they could but they can't. Each person must individually and personally resolve, I'm going to obey the gospel and I'm going to live faithful to the Lord all my life. Some may need to repent of sins that I've obeyed the gospel and be worth something to the Lord's church, to keep the church the Lord's church and all that that implies and to be as godly as you can to grow and to develop in the likeness of Christ. If you need to repent of your sins, if you're in that situation, come confessing and praying God for forgiveness. Be genuine and do it from the heart. If you need to obey the gospel to become a Christian, why not do it now while together we stand and sing?